will now open the hearing on House Bill 407. Very informative. That was very informative. Thank you. I bet you didn't fill out a card on John. Folks, if you could vacate the room so we could continue. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm busy. You're extending the time we're going to be here. I'm sorry. Thank you. 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 Thank I'd like to make an announcement before we uh, open the hearing on House Bill 407. Uh, the prime sponsor for House Bill 407 cannot be here today. Has asked that uh, the hearing be delayed to the 10th. I'm not going to delay the hearing to the 10th, but I would ask people in the audience that are here to testify, if it's not an inquisition for you to come back on the 10th, would you not testify today because of time constraints? And, and testify on the, on the tent. Uh, but if it's a problem and you have, you traveled from Colebrook and you'd have to come back on the tent, I'll allow you to testify today because I don't want to put you out. Mr. Chairman, is yes. it the tent or the seventeenth? The seventeenth is the exact date. Thank you. The tent is the continuation of this hearing. Thank you. This hearing will be recessed to the tent of February. Uh, I'd like to see you test at a 245. Uh, Representative John Burke from <laughs> Robstown is here as a co sponsor and supports the bill and will present it to us and ask for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, committee members. I very much enjoy being in front of you. I'm going to let Representative Wool talk more of the. Uh, the meat and potatoes of the bill when he speaks on it. I just want to speak briefly on why I support the bill. And the main reason I support the bill is local police are not military police. They are not military at all. Our local police should be local police only. And when they start arming themselves with military grade weapons, vehicles, they start acting like military. Case in point, just YouTube any video, just type it in, Ferguson, and all you see is, you know, armored cars, SWAT team, you know, the uh, full gear, everything else, all dressed up, you know, ready to basically go to war and that's what it looks like and our police should not be in that situation bottom line if the military is ever needed to go into a town that is what the National Guard would do with the orders of the governor and then there's accountability right now when each of these towns start setting up their militarized police side there is no accountability, or very little in my eyes. Where if the governor says, you know what, we're having a lot of trouble down in Hollis. So we're sending in the military to correct them people down there. Well, the governor is held accountable for that. 
the news media is going to be down there, everybody else is going to be watching, going, okay, she's called the National Guard out on somebody. And that is why I support this bill, because I just do not think our local police should be buying these weapons, or in most cases, getting them free with a grant from the government. And we all know where the free money comes from. <clears throat> the other thing that concerns me is once the, you know, the uh, police go militarized with these weapons, they are going to probably get it first time for free through a grant. So they call it free money. It isn't going to cost us anything. It's always free money with a grant. But what happens the next time in 20 years? Case in point, our former fire chief in Goffstown was opposed, and many people were, but unfortunately it got passed. We bought this $1.2 or $3 million fire truck. This thing has a ladder that will reach, you know, here to Vermont. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's so huge that it won't fit down some of our streets. The tallest building in Goffstown is three stories. I think St. Anselm's College has got a four-story, maybe five-story building. Manchester has five of these fire trucks. So we could just call them and say, hey, get over here quick. And they would. And why my, uh, the former fire chief was against this is he said the problem is, yes, we only paid $300,000 for this $1.1 or $2 million fire truck. But what's going to happen in 20 years? We're going to be accustomed to having it, and now it's going to cost $2 million with no more free money. So now the taxpayers are going to have to come up with $2 million. And that $1.3 million, or really the $370,000, I think it was, that it cost us, you know, according to the past fire chief, would have gone and served the town of Goffstown so much better. So that's the other reason is because once we buy these, or get these militarized vehicles, you know, they're, they're not going to, uh, you know, turn them back in. We'll have to keep buying them. Lastly, I want to take my hat off, and I think it was over in Seabrook. Remember about three weeks ago? It could have been a month and a half or two months as time flies. The chief of police, uh, and I think it was Seabrook, and I apologize. It was in that area if I'm wrong. He stood down on a situation where there was a, you know, an armed person. He got a lot of criticism for it. I look at that individual, uh, the chief, and I thank him for what he did because there's a live person today. I guarantee you, if we go down this path with militarized vehicles in weaponry, today even, the police would have gone into that building, they would have saw that individual with a gun, and they would have killed him in a heart. But by the police chief's wisdom, he stepped down, which of course the unions crabbed about it. And there's a live person today getting help, hopefully. So I just want to thank you for allowing me to speak and, and please, you know, really look at this for the longevity of, of what's going to happen in 20 years. Because I look at bills, not today, but what is it going to look like in 20, 30 years to the state of New Hampshire? Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Representative Kaplan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for taking my question. From what I understand from your conversation, I think you do not believe that at the end of World War II, when, when the United States and several other countries brought forces, armed forces, into other countries throughout the world and spread peace, right? Yes. And now, if you look at the past 10, 15, 20 years, when the government has pulled all these troops out of these countries, of many of which I lived in for two or three years, and there's all kind of violence because they don't have no police, more or less, no peacemakers there that have weaponry to protect the people. So what you're saying is they can do the same thing here. We won't have no big weapons, so... Move on in, ISIS. I, uh, I, I would disagree with that because, for one, um, I think the citizenry, if ISIS ever showed up, would take care of them. Uh, 
you know, I know they, I would take care of them if they showed up on my front yard. Um, but it's, you know, that's what we have the National Guard for. I mean, if, if it's that bad, call the National Guard in if ISIS showed up in Manchester. The, and then the governor is responsible for their actions. Somebody is. Any other questions? If, if there was a, a domestic disturbance, um, could, the, could the military be brought in to uh, quell that disturbance? On a domestic? Absolutely not. And but my point would be, what's the reason for it? Why can't the military be, be called in to quell, to be a peacemaker? Why can't There's the military? Law. And so, and what's the purpose of it? That's what, that's what I'm asking. Well, I, get, I, I apologize. I don't understand the question. I was thinking like in the domestic, you know, violence and the, the wife was beating up on the husband. You know, but you're talking about ISIS showing up. Domestic, a, a domestic disturbance that would require a response like the National Guard. Can the Army or the Navy or the Marines get a branch of the military? I, I guess I do not know if they, I, I, I think the governor can call them in okay. to protect us in a situation like that. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate your time. Representative Amanda Holden. I believe that's D I N. Holden. Holden in Manchester uh, supports the bill. Um. Thank you. Didn't, didn't ask for any time. Oh, no, three minutes, sorry. Thank you, <coughs> Representative Belanger and colleagues. Um, for the record, my name is Amanda Bolden. I represent Hillsborough District 12, and I'm here to um, ask you to kill this. Uh, no, sorry. <laughs> to support this bill. Yeah, I haven't eaten. I have low blood sugar. Um, um, I emailed all of you, but in case some of you didn't check your email, I just wanted to briefly go over what I emailed you about. Is a, a concept in social psychology called enclosed cognition. It's a new concept that's been recently discovered by some researchers at Northwestern University. Um, and the only reason I bring this up is just that I hope that you'll take this into consideration when you're looking at this legislation um, and when you're looking at police having access to this uh, kind of equipment. Um, First, I'll say, you're probably wondering what is enclosed cognition. Well, I'm sure your mother or other people give you the advice, dress for the job you want. Um, here at the State House, we have a dress code. We have rules about how we speak to each other. Um, and this is all you know, to keep decorum, to keep us in line. We can't show up in our pajamas. Because if we show up in our pajamas, we're going to act like we're in our pajamas. Um, and uh, <laughs> so enclosed cognition is the concept that um, the clothes you wear not only affect the way that other people see you, but the clothes that you wear affect how you see yourself and who you think you are. Um, and obviously, this bill is talking about more than just clothes. It's talking about tools. But in my opinion, I think that those have the same effect. Um, so uh, this, the study that these researchers at Northwestern University, um, they, they were looking at um, a concept in psychology called priming. And priming is just where, um, in a, if you're the subject of a study, um, researchers will give you something to think about for a while, and then later on they'll test you on something totally unrelated, and they'll try to figure out a link between um, how you know you spent some time thinking about this concept, and now it's affected what you're doing in the future. And, you know, it's pretty simple. If you're having a bad day, you might yell at your spouse, and it's not their fault, and it's totally unrelated, but it's something that sticks around for you. Um, but it's more than just that. With priming um, studies in the past, uh, here's a great example. Um, they did a study where people held either hot or cold drinks while meeting strangers. The strangers were actors and they behaved in exactly the same way with the people who either held the cold or the hot drinks. And then the people holding the drinks were brought back in later and they were asked, you know, what did you think about the people that you met? And they used words that kind of related to, well, I thought he was kind of cool or chilly. I didn't like his attitude. He was um, bitter. Or they might say, she was really warm and pleasant and I really enjoyed her. And they were the same actors behaving in exactly the same way. Um, and so theoretically, something as simple as how your hands feel and the temperature that you're experiencing can affect how you perceive reality. Um, and I'm sure you know that during the winter, um, people get really grumpy because it's so cold outside. And in the summer, people are really happy because it's so warm. 
Um, and then also there's stuff like, I'm sure, you know, you smell pine, like just maybe an air freshener in a car. And you think about Christmas and maybe you have happy feelings thinking about Christmas. Um, you smell popcorn, you think about the movies, even if you're not at the movie theater. So that's just the way that our brains work. It's not a, a stagnant filing system in alphabetical order. Our brains are this massive, complicated web of uh, associations. Um, you know, when you, you've got the, with the word on the tip of your tongue and you can't figure it out, but you can think of a whole bunch of words that sound almost like it, but it's not the word that you're looking for. That's how your brain works, because you have this, this web. I'm sorry, I'll continue. So in this, um, in this study, but what did your brain say when that went like <laughs> <laughs> um, So in this, this study that I hope that you guys will consider, um, it, where they developed this concept of enclosed cognition, the original study, they had two groups of people. One group of people stayed in their normal clothes, and another group of people were given doctor's coats. And they were both um, uh, given uh, intelligence tests. And before the study, it was determined that these were relatively average people, all kind of alike in their intelligence. After the test, um, the people that were wearing the doctor's coats, when they took the intelligence test, scored higher than the people in their normal clothes. They repeated the study. They split people into three groups, and a fresh group of people. And um, one group had normal clothes, and they were subjected to priming, where they had to write an essay on doctor's coats, think about doctor's coats, and then what the doctor's coat sat in the room while they took an intelligence test later. The second group was given a doctor's coat and told it was an artist's smock, and they wore it while they took the intelligence test. The third group was given a doctor's coat and told it was a doctor's coat, and they wore it while they took the intelligence test. And in summary? And afterward, the people who wore the artist mark scored the lowest. The people who um, were primed to think about doctor's coat scored higher, and the people wearing the doctor's coat scored the highest. So you can see that when people are wearing certain clothes or have access to certain tools, that they tend to see themselves as that. And it's my firm belief that if our peace officers are dressed as and armed with the tools of war, that they will then behave as if they are at war. And I hope that I'm not the enemy in that situation. I wonder who the enemy is. And to close, and to give you guys um, time to go on with the rest of your day, I do want to quote famous psychologist um, Abraham Maslow, the creator of the Maslow Hierarchy of Needs. And he said, um, if all you have is a hammer, you'll think everything is a nail. Any questions? Since you exceeded your time, you have I'm to sorry. stay here until the end of the day. Really? <laughs> 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 it's just such an interesting topic. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Uh, I just have a comment. Great testimony. Thanks. I'm sorry that I am wrong. Any other sorry questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Brigadier General Carolyn Prolesman from the Attitude General's Department. Uh, did not indicate whether she was opposed or supported the bill and asked for one minute. And that will all take. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chair, and to all members of the committee. I thank you for this quick opportunity to uh, just update you. The Adjutant General's Department uh, is neutral on this bill. However, there is a provision in this bill under paragraph 312 that requires the Adjutant General to notify the Attorney General's Office of violations of that paragraph. And so we have to make it known to this committee that there is no ability for our department to make any such notification. We have no access to the material that was required uh, to, be, uh, to be disclosed to the Attorney General. So we just wanted to make that note in this bill that whatever happens to the bill, the Adjutant General cannot comply with that, with that uh, statement. Find that, sir, I have no other comment. Well, I'm going to be called sir by a general. <laughs> Many ways you outrank me, sir. <laughs> From another sterling. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Chair. If you call me sir, I was a corporal. Uh, all right. <laughs> my, uh, my question to you is, is uh, <coughs> can you explain what's generally regarded as the policy of posse cumitatis? Posse Comitatus allows National Guard folks in the state active duty status as authorized by the governor to uh, to participate in law enforcement activities. Thank you, Mayor. You're welcome. Any other questions? Representative Thank you, Mr. Chair. In, uh, I don't know if you have a bill in front of you. I do, I do. Line 21. What's the difference between the State Guard and the National Guard? The State Guard is the guard uh, that, uh, in fact, there was a testimony on that particular bill today. It's RSA 111, designed uh, to allow the governor, in times of emergency as it stands right now, uh, to call up a sort of civil force uh, to uh, aid uh, in defense of the state, in is the absence of a National Guard. Is that, should that be State Guard or National Guard? That's State Guard. It should be the way it is. Thank you. Anyway. 
Seeing no other questions, thank you very much. You're mm -hmm. very welcome. Major Russ Conti, Department of Safety, opposes the bill as written testimony, has asked for no time to speak, therefore. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, he's only going to hand out stuff. Yeah, I uh, usually ask for five minutes or so, sir. I didn't put that on there. I apologize. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll remember the committee. Thanks so much for hearing me today. Uh, I'm very happy to be here representing the Department of Safety. And although the uh, uh, the written testimony is a couple of pages, I'll, I'll try to uh, paraphrase uh, much of what's in there having read it. Um, the bill would prohibit the acquisition, purchase, and obtaining by state, county, or local law enforcement agencies of armored personnel carriers, Title II weapons, unmanned aerial vehicles and unmanned ground vehicles by police departments unless the items are already available on the open national commercial market. Uh, and require the police to for forfeit uh, and any of the, the described items under the federal 1033 surplus government equipment program. Um, I've been with the state police for nearly 30 years prior to, to the assignment and now I act as the LESO, the 1033 DLA program director for the state. So I have some knowledge of, of the equipment who gets it, basically what the uses are. Uh, by way of explanation, you can read along Title II weapons or firearms named by the National Firearms Act, and those are in fact your, you know, your fully automatic weapons, your short barreled weapons, um, all of that stuff. And that is the stuff that is basically, um, uh, it's, a, it's allowable for private citizens with the right permits from the federal government. It's also used by military and police. Pretty self-explanatory. The expressed concern over the bill is the is the what's been called the militarization of the police. And although the intent may be meritorious, the effort on legitimate police operations as the bill is worded can greatly inhibit the ability of the police to deal with an increasingly heavily armed segment of the criminal element to defend against foreign and domestic terrorism. Uh, currently, the state police and all the two regional SWAT teams have either an armored personnel carrier, so-called Bearcat. Um, these, uh, these are often confused in people's minds as something that are used to run through buildings or uh, uh, mow down buildings or run over cars when in fact they are. Um, they are not used like the military uses them, but they have a purpose in civilian life and that is for rescue. These are, uh, these are vehicles that are bullet resistant. Uh, these are times when you have uh, a citizen, an officer, anybody that's involved in a critical incident that needs to be rescued. And the only way you're going to go in and get those is with a vehicle that's bullet resistant. Cruisers are not. State, state police or local police cruisers do not, they are not bullet resistant. Um, so that's really what it is. They're used to transfer, uh, transport SWAT personnel. They're also used to transport medics. Uh, most SWAT teams have medics. And uh, there's a real purpose between before, um, other than assault, to have these vehicles. Many times, uh, the purpose is, like I said, to go in and rescue, to go in and deliver uh, something that can be used for surveillance purposes. Uh, another issue with, uh, with the bill is it does away with, with either aerial or ground um, uh, equipment that can either uh, increase the view or it can increase the view at the ground level. And I'll just share this with you. Aerial speaking, drones, and what everybody has concerns about, have been used by the military for some time. They are being used uh, in different parts of the world for law enforcement purposes for the simple reason of this. Uh, they're very cheap to operate, and they're obviously in a dangerous situation when you can shoot at a helicopter or an aircraft. Uh, there's no lives to be lost with an aerial drone. So it, it is being explored. As far as ground usage, uh, we regularly use uh, the robots that we have in state police for the bomb squad to assist in SWAT operations, many times people that are holed up or people that commit crimes have explosives or improvised explosives. And I think uh, we can, there's been several instances just in the last two or three years where the robot's been able to go in and give us, you know, the intelligence information that we needed to make a better decision on how we would act, how we would handle the situation. Many times the best thing to do is to pull out and leave it and, uh, and contain it the best you can to keep, uh, to keep the public safe. If you go as far back as 1986 uh, in the state of New Hampshire, there was a police officer in Hopkins, and his name is Ira Mignall. And many of you may remember this. I was a member of the state police then. 
there was a gentleman, a young man, who got a hold of his father's uh, firearms and ammunition and basically was shooting at vehicles on Interstate 89. Ira Mignall was, was a Hopkinton police officer and uh, put his own life at risk to try to stop the vehicles on 89, and he was shot, uh, and he, uh, he suffered some pretty serious injuries. He laid in the roadway for, uh, if my recollection is correct, for over an hour because we had no vehicles to go and basically rescue him. We had nothing that was boat resistant. Um, and what ended up happening is he was on the verge of, of exsanguinating, of bleeding to death. And two troopers, uh, a couple of police officers, went in and risked their lives. And uh, they used a the cruiser to load him up and take him to the hospital. He survived, but, uh, but uh, frankly, uh, he was never the same. And I know Ira, he was the chief. Uh, and a very honorable man, but he, he dealt with pain and, uh, from those injuries and will for the rest of his life. Um, it's, it's, example, it's an example of what the problems are with the bill. It's an example of what uh, this equipment can be used for. It's an example of how the police are viewing policing, how the police are viewing the criminal element that we're dealing with. You could read along in this, and there's a couple of uh, paragraphs in here that have to do with uh, what happened in Los Angeles many, many years ago. Uh, there was a bank robbery where the Los Angeles Police Department was, was clearly outgunned. But I submit to you that uh, several years ago there was, uh, there was two troopers um, that were killed, a judge and a newspaper reporter in Colbrook. And I can tell you that the gentleman at that time was in possession of a military rifle, um, an AR-15 pilot's fire rifle. We did not have those rifles issued at the time. I don't believe any police agencies did. Um, and I can tell you that uh, on that day it would have made a difference. On that day an armored vehicle probably would have made a difference. Um, and we all know the tragedy that it affected the North Country and frankly I don't believe Hulk Colbrook's ever been the same. Uh, shortly after that, through the LESO program, uh, the state police and several other agencies were our first uh, time we were able to get long ref rifles that can combat a criminal that was that well armed came from the military. It was something that we embraced, and at this point in time, the state police had patrol rifles. Most police agencies do, um, and I think they're used for all the right purposes. The training is there. Uh, the purpose is for active shooters, whether to protect people in schools or at, at you know public events, whatever it may be. And I can tell you that in my 30 years, um, you know, there's been a lot of changes in New Hampshire. Uh, it's still a beautiful place to live, but what we have is we have a criminal element here that grows and, and it gets uh, a little more depth, it gets better armed, and unfortunately we've had police officers shot, as you know. Uh, recently we've had police officers shot, they're shot at, and I think it's something that we have to realize that we have to, uh, we have to uh, take uh, recognition of. Um, you know, I'll just end by saying this, we're trying to match the police, and I think, sir, you said it very well. We're trying to match the police with what we're up against, and I think it's been an ongoing issue in law enforcement, I think it's an ongoing issue in society. Just how far do you go? At what point do you, uh, do you allow um, you know, uh, something that's evil to overcome what's good? So we're here to protect you, we're here to protect ourselves, and I think in, in the very end, uh, this equipment is, is used for the right purposes. Um, it is not the military, militarization of the police department, but it's equipping the police departments for what they need. And again, I'm going to remind you that these vehicles are, are not used for the intended purposes of the military, but used to go in situations where we need uh, protection and we can rescue. Take any questions. Any questions? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Mr. Mignall, we notwithstanding F-15s or B-52s, I assume you probably don't want those. Do you see, and, I, and understanding where we started at with hatchets and bows and arrows and keep moving up and with parity with the police, hopefully, or better, against the bad guys, is there any military equipment out there today that you would say would not be appropriate for the civilian police force? That would not be appropriate? I mean, I think you get, we certainly, uh, you know, um, we certainly don't need uh, anything that can level a building. What we're really after is this. We're after equipment that is bullet resistant. And the one thing I want to remind you of, the, the, the biggest, one of the biggest um, problems with terrorism in, in the world, and certainly in this country, we were, we were touched by it a couple years ago at the Boston Marathon, is improvised explosive devices. And when we looked at the purchase of the equipment that we have, the state police has, and many of the agencies, very high on the list, if not number one on the list, was the ability to go into an area and resist that. So I think the bigger, the bigger threat to us 
is things that you can basically go to a hardware store and buy. It can be quite lethal. So I think um, as far as law enforcement goes, I think they have a good view of it. I think you're going to have weapons out there that, uh, that are going to be equal to what you can buy and what you can own. And I don't think anybody out there, other than probably a very small segment of collectors at very high levels, have weapons beyond that. And I think those people are very well vetted. Uh, you, know, I, 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 you know, I certainly support people that own uh, firearms, but I think it's, it's at a level where it's probably going to stay. Uh, but I think the vehicles themselves and the LES pro, LESO program uh, allows uh, police to engage at that level. And you're talking about things like MRAPs. You'd like to have those, but you don't need a howitzer to take down a bill. Absolutely, sir. Thank you. Other questions? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for taking my question. How much is too much? How much is too much, sir? Uh, I would say... How, how many armored personnel carriers should we have in the state? Well, sir, we, we have, uh, they're done regionally, but I'm going to answer your question with a question. I was at Cobra, and I knew those troopers. Um, I had met that judge. How much is too much that you can put up with a crime? At what time is it so shocking to society where somebody has to take a stand? On that day, we were clearly outgunned. We clearly didn't have equipment, the equipment that we needed. We did the best we could. But four people died. Uh, so I guess how much is too much, sir? We're not after um, we're not after anything that's gonna that's gonna make the public think that we're trying to take anything over. But we, as a as a profession in law enforcement, I'm not just talking about New Hampshire. I'm talking about the country. Has to have the tools, and the tools have to evolve. And as crime has evolved, as criminals have evolved, whether it's with hardware like weapons or with software like cyber attacks, we have to stay up with it. So the question is, sir, I don't know, but I can tell you this. The state police and police officers in general in the state are here to serve you. And we want to make sure that we can do that effectively. And we want to make sure that we have at least equal to what the threat is. And that's, that's really what it comes down to. So we have no way of knowing when we can say enough is enough. Oh, sir, I, I think we have a way of knowing. And I think the way of knowing is, is if we can do the best we can to combat the problems that we have right now and not let this evolve, we can, we can control it. We can control the weapons that people have access to. We can control the sentences. You make decisions every day here on how long people go to prison and what should happen to that. So it's at what point society takes a stand. And a stand is not just firearms. The stand is attitudes, it's acceptance, it's tolerance, it's a lot of things. Uh, but we're certainly not here to take on weapons that are going to put us in a position where we're scared instead of serve. Um, so I, I hear what you're saying about defensive weapons, defensive versus offensive. And it seems to me that a lot of these uh, defensive armored vehicles that, that might they might uh, be able to be able to be accessorized to become offensive, but they're not. But they're used in, in SWAT rates, uh, uh, you know, at a certain frequency. And my question is, are those statistics kept, the frequency of the raids, uh, and are they tracked over time? Can we see if they're becoming more common or less common? Um, the use of the armored vehicles themselves, sir? The, the SWAT raids and, and whatever whatever weaponry or defensive equipment you have going yeah. is that tracked and can this body take a look at that? The number of the number of tactical calls it yeah. is tracked. Um, I certainly can't speak for the whole state, but I can speak for the state police. Do we have a SWAT team that that tracks that um, and and, uh, and they're reporting on it? Um, but I, I guess. I mean, I guess what I would only say is, is your question to say that the advent of these vehicles has increased the, the ability for us to, um, to employ them? Because they're, I can tell you that for a tactical vehicle, um, that is employed at, at times where we have no control over using that asset. Something's happened that we put the asset into play yeah, I, to I'm, assure safety. I'm asking about uh, transparency so mm -hmm. that the public can see how often those that equipment is deployed. Is, is we certainly we certainly have statistics on it. I, I can't see why we wouldn't share those like we share any other information. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
you, sir. Do you see, how about phrasing right? Do you see a difference, though, between the state police and the multitude of police departments throughout the state in their abilities, their training. And you're describing something that we're only, what, a million and a half people here in New Hampshire, okay? The city's bigger than us. We just spread out a little bit. you see a difference on how this equipment would be managed and used or obtained for the state police Versus, and I won't name any town, but you know, some somebody with two part-time cops and uh, paid on call police department. I think the best way to speak to that is in my time in, in managing uh, in managing the, the program and, and having a nexus between uh, law enforcement agencies and their ability to get this demilitarized equipment. Is that was all taken into account. Um, there had to be an explanation provided, and I can tell you that the example you used, that's a good example. If, uh, if uh, somebody came and wanted a piece of equipment, and where, where you are as an example, our advice would be you have a regional team that serves you. So we wouldn't facilitate that. Um, there is rules. Uh, uh, just because the military is, is uh, providing equipment to law enforcement, it doesn't mean they'll provide you anything. It doesn't mean that they don't want accountability. And, and actually, any, any piece of equipment that they give you that can have an offensive use has to be basically tallied up. There has to be uh, there has to be a full account every year. We have right now three uh, three members of the state police, all are sergeants that do nothing but the accountability part of it. So we have to report back to the federal government, to the military, what this stuff is being used for. And at any time, um, if it's a violation, uh, we can come in and act as the controlling agency, but certainly uh, so can the federal government. So. We, uh, you know, we do take a close look and monitor it closely, so exactly what you described doesn't happen. Thank you. Seeing all the questions, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Um, we're supposed to take up the last bill of the day, House Bill 662 at 320, it's 315. Thank you, sir. I've got four more people signed up to speak. Um, and I've got three days to go. I'm going to have to recess Major. this hearing Major. to February 10th. Hearing is recessed to February 10 at 1.30. Uh, last week, I kept your cards, and I noticed that some of you have signed up again, just to be sure, but I didn't forget you. Um, I recognize Chris Cantwell, King. He's on his way. How could he fill out a card? He filled it out last week. All right. And Kenneth Medla. Or Medea? Uh, Miola? Uh, that's Chief Miola. He was here for the hearing. He couldn't come back. I have his testimony. All right. I can fill that card out. Um, Rick Sircor, uh, Attorney Chair, Elizabeth Chair, Maynard, Chair, Maynard, John Williams. Uh, hi, I'm John Williams. I'm the, uh, the Director for Legislative Affairs for Health and Services, and uh, Rick Ursenti is our Emergency Management uh, Director, and we certainly wanted to have him here, but unfortunately he's not able to make it, but I do have with us uh, Attorney Elizabeth Maynard, who is prepared to uh, provide you some uh, commentary. Okay, signed in. Uh, asked for less than five minutes, and does not indicate whether there's been support or opposition. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I just wanted to say that the department is neutral on this bill. I think we have some serious concerns that may make it difficult to procure um, equipment in the future and our ability to prepare and to respond in a timely manner. And specifically, um, the issue is the term military grade hardware. Um, I looked that up, just, I couldn't find a legal definition of that, so I Googled it, and I got everything from sort of elastic bands, um, ribbon, fabric, buckles, screws, and washers. Um, 
which I'm sure isn't the intent of the bill, but I think that the language needs to be clarified a little bit so that so as not to prohibit the department from getting um, equipment that only be, may be available through the military yeah. or through um, you know federal um, places or grant monies, etc. So um, so that would be the request is that uh, that particular terminology, military grade hardware, um, be clarified to reflect the fact that it wouldn't prohibit um, getting things that couldn't be purchased elsewhere. Any questions? Any questions? Could you spell your last name? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, my name is Elizabeth Maynard, M-A-Y-N-A-R-D. Okay. Um, I'm an attorney with the Department of Health and Human Services. Normally, I represent public health, but here uh, today I'm on, here on behalf of ESU. And as John said in the beginning, um, Rick Crescenti is not only the head of ESU, so he could provide more specifics as to what sort of military-grade hardware um, could be construed to be encased in that definition, but um, unfortunately I couldn't get in touch with him when I rushed down here, so. And, and Chairman Belinger, if I could just offer some just other uh, commentary. Uh, the department's concern arises particularly around the area of emergency management services. And, and the key to that is um, at, at being uh, responsive to uh, public health threats or incidents, we may be called in occasion to address situations uh, such as pandemics uh, around communicable diseases. So one of the questions we're looking for for unintended consequences is whether or not such things as medicines or vaccines that are purchased through the CDC and stuff might be unintentionally covered within the scope of this legislation. And we just want to note that uh, we're certainly here to work with the committee as well as the sponsor to narrowly tailor the bill so it's clear that if it's uh, about municipalities and purchasing such things as bear cats, for example, that it doesn't encroach on the area of emergency services. And that's why Elizabeth and I are here today to let you know of our concerns. Okay. Questions? Oh, vaccines and medicine. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thanks for being here and taking our, taking our questions. Is there something in the bill that makes you think that your interests are, are included in this? I, I think, and if I can respond on uh, carrying out on what Elizabeth was framing as some of the issues, the, the word equipment or um, other definitional uh, items in there, it's not clear what they um, uh, are entailing. And our concern is that the net is too wide on the legislation is currently drafted. And we, and clearly, if it was the intent of this committee or the bill sponsor to cover such things as medicines for addressing communicable diseases, I, my sense is that's not the case. So we're here to make sure that that is addressed because the concern is that the definitions that are currently used could, in fact, be construed by some individuals, well intended attorney types like Elizabeth, um, that it might include such things as cots, uh, bariatrics, uh, things that are enable us to respond to uh, emergency situations. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for taking my question. So uh, we have provisions in the communities that if there's an emergency, um, there's a leeway, you know, respond to the emergency and let the legislative body know afterward that you had to, you know, in essence, it's, it's written in the law. I mean, we must have emergency provisions where the governor can declare a state of emergency and do things that may not be provided for through the letter. Could you address that, how a cot would, you know, if they really knew it was an emergency, we needed a cot, how this might preclude us from getting a cot? And, and Chairman Melinda, if we could respond to President Cheney's question. Uh, it is true that there is a very uh, well-defined construct in terms of the governor's authority as well as the commissioner of the Department of Health and Human Services authority to, and as well as emergency management and Department of Safety. So there's a whole broad uh, range of those agencies in the executive branch that are uh, at the state level um, uh, able to respond to those uh, incidents. We also work with core groups of people such as the uh, MRC, which involves military, not military, but rather medical experts who actually volunteer, give their time to help address those kind of situations. So my understanding is this bill isn't touching upon that existing authority. It specifically is talking about precluding the purchase of certain types of either um, vehicles, equipment uh, that otherwise aren't available on the regular commercial market. And that's where our concern is that the, the scope of this goes wider than the intended purpose of the legislation. And we're, we're just here to assist you folks in identifying that as a concern of ours. And we'd be remiss if we didn't come here today. And I have to say, Elizabeth hung out with you folks on the snow day on Thursday to be able to make sure that you heard these Thank important you. concerns. That includes snowblowers? <laughs> 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 
Good afternoon. I appreciate your attention on this, what I consider to be a very important issue. I have a lot of personal experience uh, with this issue. I was one of the people who was active in Keene, as you may recall. There was some news uh, that was generated out of Keene back in 2012 when the city council there uh, was looking at getting one of these bear cats. Ultimately, they did get the bear cat, um, but unfortunately, uh, well, I guess unfortunately they did get the bear cat. And they did it in total defiance of what the supermajority of people in Keene wanted. This was an, an, really an amazing thing to watch. Uh, it was a bipartisan thing or a nonpartisan thing, if you want to use that term. Republicans, Democrats, people who have no party affiliation, people came out in mass uh, to the city council hearing. It was the most packed city council meeting I've ever seen. Usually, no one comes to city council meetings, or very few people do. This was such a full house, they actually had to have the fire uh, department down in the, in the lobby. How does that relate to the bill? I'm letting you know that there's a lot of, of opposition for the militarization of police. They actually had the fire department in the lobby turning people away because they had reached their maximum capacity. So the, I talked to some of the, uh, all of the city councilors about this matter, and one of the councilors informed me that about 80 to 90 percent of the contacts that they received on this issue were firmly against the Bearcat. And again, it has spanned across all political boundaries. So despite the fact that 80 to 90 percent of the people were against this monstrosity, uh, the city council voted overwhelmingly to accept it. Of course, we saw the same thing repeated again in Concord uh, shortly thereafter. Mm -hmm. So it seems pretty clear to me that the people of New Hampshire do not appreciate their police being militarized and turned into this sort of scary force. But we like the idea of having friendly peace officers, people who we can make eye contact with, people who aren't you know, between some sort of barrier uh, and the rest of us. So there's this long trend across the United States of militarizing the police, and New Hampshire to some extent has resisted that. And I'd like to see that continue, and I think this particular bill is a step in the right direction. There are a couple of important questions specifically about the wording of the bill that I have. Um, one is the bill mentions that if the department is to actually acquire something in violation of this bill, that it will be forfeit. It doesn't say how it will be forfeit. What's the process to where will it be forfeit? You know, are you going to sell it on eBay? Uh, I'm not sure how that's going to work. Um, and then also, what about the current equipment? I think that's one of the parts about the bill that's somewhat vague, is that it says that any military equipped vehicle or great hardware acquired in violation hereof shall be forfeited. So it makes it seem like only what is acquired if this passes from then on. What about the current Bearcats that have caused so much controversy? Uh, if this bill passes, I would like to see that other equipment be addressed in some sort of fashion. So I've got a lot of experience on this. I've been on the streets. I've petitioned. I've gathered hundreds of petition signatures just in Keen alone uh, op opposing this militarization. And so I've got a lot of experience. So any questions, I'm happy to take. Thank you. Any questions? Was that a big thing? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the very last word in the bill for the effective date says forfeited. I was wondering, who would the equipment be forfeited to? That was my question. Oh. But that's what I'm saying. That's what I was suggesting was incomplete about the bill was that it doesn't specify how a department would forfeit the equipment if they acquired something and then you know they were caught doing that and well you broke this law what do you do with it how do you actually forfeit the equipment so to whom do you forfeit it so you favor to the bill or oh I, I, I totally support the bill if that wasn't clear but this bill restricts the militarization of the police. It, allow, it uh, only allows them to acquire equipment that you or I could go out and purchase uh, on the open marketplace. So yeah, yeah absolutely. Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you. Um, uh, in your experience, uh, is, it, is it difficult to, to, ident to uh, define exactly what we're talking about, what stuff we're talking about, what we're talking about? And, and does this bill, in your opinion, adequately describe the kind of equipment we we're talking about and the kind of equipment we're not talking about. Yeah, I think that it, it makes it pretty clear. I mean, military equipped vehicles and equipment that aren't readily available in an open national commercial market 
Um, I mean, if it needs to be clarified somehow, I'm sure this committee can come up with, with better wording, but it made it pretty clear to me. I didn't read through this and think, oh, they won't be able to buy a cot. Uh, I'm pretty sure that's not what people are uh, concerned about here. Any other questions? Yeah, you, spent, you said you spent a lot of time getting signatures in Keene. Was that before or after the Pumpkin Fest? Long before. Are uh, you referring to this year's Pumpkin Fest? Yes, when they had all the riots and the trouble that they had that you know, it's could use some equipment. It's interesting you bring that up because I was actually down there during Pumpkin Fest. I recorded uh, some of the video footage of how the police were behaving in that particular day. And this kind of goes back, if you remember the testimony we had last week uh, from Amanda Bolden where she talked about how uh, people, when they're put into certain roles, in certain uniforms, they behave in a, way, a certain way. And the more you militarize the police, the more of this equipment you give them, the more they behave in this way that is very anti-community and anti-social. So I'll give you one example of what happened during Pumpkin Fest. The Bearcat actually was not used during Pumpkin Fest. It was actually parked down the street. So they didn't utilize the Bearcat at all. But they did have uh, countless state police officers and local cops all over the place. I saw more than, I saw once with my own eyes, and I caught video of this, uh, right outside of Keene State College, there's a little convenience store on the corner. Three young gentlemen from Keene State were walking down the street. Now this was long after the riots had subsided. This was at nighttime, everything was calm. There was a huge pack of state police officers that were armored and they you know, were wearing all black and they did not look like you know, friendly law enforcement or friendly peace officers. These three guys came up this street that I had just come up not too long beforehand. Um, and I was told I couldn't go that direction, so I went and Sir, averted my path. What does that have to do with the bill? Yeah, I'm talking about the, uh, the militarization of the police and the attitude of police officers who have this. this yeah. He asked me specifically about Pumpkin Fest. Can I, I respond to that? Pumpkin Fest. I'm giving you an example of something that the police did during Pumpkin Fest that I don't believe would have happened if we didn't have this militarization of the police. I'll wrap up my comments very shortly if that's all right. I'd yes, like if it's all right yeah. with you, you exceeded the time that you requested already. Well, I appreciate the flexibility. So what happened was the three young gentlemen had come out. They wanted to go to the convenience store to uh, get some sort of late night snack. And the officer started to yell at them, get back, turn around, go away. And these kids were just so shocked. They just wanted to go to the store. There was nothing happening. And they didn't turn around fast enough, I guess. And the officers literally tackled these guys. Uh, one of the parents of these kids is suing as a result of that. And I just, I'm really concerned on this issue. And I appreciate you paying attention. Any other questions? Thank you for your testimony. Yeah, if you'd like to see that video, let me know. And I'll email it to you. Thank you. Elizabeth Sargent from the CN uh, yep. Group, New Hampshire Association of Chiefs of Police, yep. supports the bill. Yep. No, should be opposers. Should be opposers. <laughs> oh, sorry. She was busy spelling a couple words. I don't testify very often. Um, um, chairman, <laughs> members of the committee, <laughs> my name is Beth Sargent. I work for Champagne Capital Group. We're a lobbying firm here in Concord. One of the clients I represent is the New Hampshire Association of Chiefs of Police, and we are in opposition of the bill. Uh, Chief Miola, I just passed his testimony in. He was here last week before the hearing got recessed. So in his testimony, he was able to also address some concerns and some questions that were asked. And I would summarize the three points um, that I think he made. One, this should be a town decision. Two, um, this equipment, according to his testimony on the bottom of page, um, two says that this equipment can be purchased already on the open market. And the third point I wanted to make um, was that they consider these vehicles rescue vehicles. And there are some extreme circumstances in which this could lead to protection of the public. Um, and there have been some police shootings. If they had had um, a vehicle such as this type, it would prevent, they'd be able to get um, a, a police officer who was shot back behind the line of fire. So they would see these as rescue vehicles. And his testimony is pretty complete, so I won't add any more. Okay. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Um, are there any limits on what a police department can purchase? Like, for instance, can they purchase a tank or a bazooka? I don't think they can purchase anything without the town's um, approval. They have to go before the town with their budget, so I don't believe that they'd be able to do that without a public hearing, and certainly the... So it would be up to individual town? Yes. Okay. Yes. <coughs> Thank you. So there's no state oversight, basically, is what you're I don't think so because each community has to have public hearings and they have to get approval from the selectmen on the budget. So I would say that that would be a town decision for sure. Okay, thank you. Representative Lynn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Can you tell me where Bearcats are available on the market? I do not know. I just looked and I don't see any anywhere. So okay, I'll get them out to you. Yeah, that would be good. I'll ask Chief Meal to send you an email. Yes, because yep. I'd like to buy one. <laughs> yeah, I'll go to Hazard. All right, great. Let's do that. Thanks. I'd like to know where you can get them. Brad Simpkins from uh, Department of Resources and Looking on No position. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, for the record, I'm Brad Simpkins with the Division of Forests and Lands within the Department of Resources and Economic Development. Appreciate the opportunity to take a few minutes. Uh, to talk about House Bill 407. Uh, we do not have a position on this, but I did want to make the committee aware that there is a similar program on the firefighting side. Uh, we actually have two. One's called FEPP, or the Federal Excess Property Program, which we've been involved in for many decades. We have quite a few pieces of apparatus out in uh, fire departments for brush firefighting vehicles. And then there's another program which we're entering called the FFP, or Firefighter Program, which is uh, somewhat similar, only the title can actually change hands. Under FEPP, the feds always retain the title. Um, the way this is currently written, I did, I did want to bring it to your attention, this would impact the types of equipment that fire departments could get. Uh, two and a half tons, or deuce and a half, as they're commonly referred to, five tons. Several communities in the state currently have them. They use, use them as off-road tankers. We would not be able to acquire them uh, the way this bill is written because uh, my understanding is they would not be available on an open commercial market because they're military specs made for off-road. Humvees would be another one. Uh, a, a department would not be able to get a Humvee to turn into a brush firefighting uh, piece of equipment. Um, so I did want to uh, bring that uh, to your attention. Also, the, the uh, question came up earlier about forfeiting. Under the FFP law, it would have to go back to the... Uh, federal government that's that's the the law um, so this this is a benefit under the FFP program the uh, fire department has one year in order to take that piece of military equipment and get it in service as a firefighting vehicle so I was here last week I, I don't think that was the intent but I did want to let you know it would impact what fire departments could get also thank you thank you mr. chair so obviously we can get uh, Humvees that publicly people can find those and buy them, do whatever they want with them, convert them. So would that fall in under this bill? It's my understanding, and, and actually between last week's hearing and this week's hearing, I called the, the uh, person from the U.S. Forest Service in D.C. who runs this program and asked about Humvees. And they said um, certain Humvees you would not be able to get because of how they're equipped and they're built for off-road specifications. Um, I do know you can buy some Humvees in certain situations. I don't know if they've been modified prior to being able to be purchased, but they said yes, Humvees you would not. And, it, and part of it has to do with how uh, the Department of Defense classifies. There's different what are called D-mail codes and then different uh, sensitivities. So um, without getting into all the weeds because it's a little uh, confusing to me, they said that's where Although it may not be the intent of this bill, if something is listed by Department of Defense as a, as a D-mill uh, mill like B or something like that, it's considered sensitive. And so we wouldn't be able to acquire it because it's not available in a commercial market. And they specifically said two and a half tons and five tons. Uh, they don't believe we would be allowed to receive any more of the way this bill is written. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Chris Cantwell. Thank you for your time. Um, I think it's kind of sad we're having this uh, discussion now. I, I had moved to this state in 2012 from New York, and a lot of the reason that I had moved uh, out of New York was because of New York's gun control laws. Mm -hmm. uh, a government makes excuses for disarming its citizenry, but the reason that they do it is because they want to do things to you 
that they can't do to you if you're armed. Mm -hmm. uh, luckily, we don't have that problem here. Uh, I'm actually carrying a revolver right now. I imagine some of you are armed. And as they say, that makes for a polite society. Uh, but when the state of New Hampshire gears up for war, when they equip themselves with weaponry that is not available to the rest of us, that is no different than taking our guns away. You disrupt the balance of power between government and the governed to the point that we have to be afraid of you, and that's completely unacceptable. Thomas Jefferson said, right? When the government feels, fears the people, there's liberty. When the people fear the government, there's tyranny. And I was here last week when, the, uh, when representatives from the police were, were talking, and it seemed to me that they just want to be in a position where they can dominate any situation. I understand why they want to be able to do that. Generally, I like the good guys to be better armed than the bad guys. It's unfortunate that we have a history, maybe less so in this state than in other places, but there is a history of governments violently repressing their citizenry. So I get really scared when the state of New Hampshire or the city of Keene or any other, or Concord or anybody else, uh, gets to a point where they need military hardware to do regular law enforcement capabilities, because as we know, police officers' jobs are less dangerous than the average construction <coughs> worker, and we don't want to go and give weapons of war to roofers. If there's any questions, I'll be happy to answer them, but that's my testimony. Any questions? Thank you, thank you. Thank you. There being no other people to uh, testify that signed in, is, is there a blue sheet? Probably from the last time, Representative, so, and I read it at that time. I close the hearing on House Bill 407. That's right. We'll now go and do executive session.